my sound man in the background there, see if we are recording. Uh, confirming recording has begun. Already, thanks, Brett. Alrighty, folks. So this is our uh, seventh tech talk. Um, this will be a wrap up of the the um, what we call the core services as part of the Dell team. Um, so if you look at the, uh, the diagram out there, that infamous EdgeX diagram, that middle layer that's always in dark purple, this is the last of those that we'll cover in our uh, Tech Talk stake. And it's one that I think is a pretty powerful service, one that um, we're not taking full advantage yet of its capabilities, um, but I think we're going to be doing so much more in the future. So we're gonna talk about configuration and the registry uh, microservice. Um, so let's see here, whoops, get my mouse back. Uh, so we'll take a look here at uh, what, what its purpose is. Um, we'll look up at the uh, makeup, the technology makeup that makes um, the configuration registry service run. In particular, we're going to look at a, at a tool called uh, Console, or I guess I should say more of an, an, another open source project that's out there um, that we're taking full advantage of. Uh, and what's, uh, um, what's that particular library providing for us? Um, we'll also look at how other microservices are integrated with the configuration and registry uh, service. Uh, we'll see that that's an integral part of how this whole system works. We'll look at how it provides um, configuration data back out to those microservices. We'll look at a web interface that's actually built into console and therefore immediately available to our EdgeX product. In fact, um, we certainly know that in the future, more UIs are going to be made available around EdgeX. Uh, Dell's created a few, and I also have requests for them. Well, with regard to configuration registry, this is one place where there already is a UI. And in fact, it can be a UI that can help you understand kind of what the health and status of EdgeX is. So I always tell people, this is a great place to kind of start and get a sense of what's up and what's not up. We'll look at the uh, registry and um, service health mechanism that makes that work. And then we'll also talk a bit about some um, capabilities that are out there, but not being quite used yet with regard to both our own microservice as well as console as a whole. So we'll look at something called watchers and we'll look at some future considerations um, that we might want to consider architecturally as well as uh, programmatically uh, going forward. Lastly, we'll wrap up with a Q&A session. Okay, uh, so as I mentioned, this is the last of the uh, core services that we're going to be chatting about here in these tech talks. Uh, we um, we have called it, that is the members of Dell have called it the registry and config service, sometimes a CNR service, um, but it is the uh, kind of the first up of all of the microservices, at least in any kind of production environment. This one comes up and then all the other services check in with it as we'll learn. So when you're doing things like uh, Docker work or you're using Docker to help run uh, EdgeX, you'll see as part of the Docker compose file and all the instructions we provide around how to get things up with regard to EdgeX and Docker. Um, this is the first one out of the chute. So what is its role? What is the configuration and registrations microservices role? Uh, centralized management of a couple things. Centralized management first off of configuration information. And by configuration information, I mean what are typically key value pairs that help drive almost any application. Uh, for example, your, your server port, uh, you may want to change that. And so you don't want to hard code that into an application. So you provide some sort of mechanism that says, hey, our, for our application, its server port is, and you provide a number. Um, we call it key value pairs because usually in configuration, it's just that, some sort of um, name associated to some sort of value and the program uses the value by that lookup name. You'll see the same thing if you're doing things like Windows applications with INI files. That essentially is configuration information very, very similar to what we're using with EdgeX and this configuration registration service. It also provides, that is the configuration registration service also provides location and status of the various microservices. Each microservice checks in with the uh, configuration registration uh, service. It provides its uh, location, if you will, and provides a mechanism for it to check on its health periodically. We'll talk a bit about that as we get deeper into the presentation. With regard to the uh, configuration information, what we'll see is that every uh, microservice in the EdgeX environment actually has a, a built-in set of configuration files. What the configuration service uh, does is allow that uh, information to be overridden. In particular, you're gonna want this for dynamic situations where you wanna be able to change some of the configuration information. In fact, in some cases, you may actually wanna change it 
on the fly during runtime. So that's what really provides the dynamic capabilities that uh, allow things like microservices to move around in an environment or to change a setting so that you get different um, uh, programmatic uh, operations uh, from any one of the microservices. It also provides a means to notify uh, the uh, EdgeX microservices when a change to a configuration has occurred. That might be to the same service or it might be to other services. So for example, if we um, wanted to dynamically change the port of one of our uh, microservices, some of the other microservices may need to know that so they know to call on that particular microservice at that new port. There is a means within inside of the configuration registration microservice for that to happen, where a broadcast can go out to tell other using microservices that some sort of configuration change has occurred. Now, the registry part of the configuration and registration microservice is all about location and operating status. So each microservice, when it starts, or as we like to say, when it bootstraps itself up, it's required, uh, required to register itself in with the CNR microservice. It does that... Um, uh, in, uh, in libraries that we've embedded into our microservices. There's also a REST API involved. We'll talk a bit about that as we get into detail. And when it does so too, there's also an address, a ping address that that microservice provides to the configuration registration service that allows that configuration registration service to hit that address periodically to check on its health and its welfare to essentially know when it's up or when it's down. So as you can see, this has some applicability potentially to things like some of our uh, system management uh, services that might uh, come into EdgeX in the future. Okay, so uh, let's talk a bit about the technology that um, underlies the configuration and registration microservice. As I mentioned, the very, very important tool here that drives everything is an open source product called Console. You can find it out there at console.io. Uh, this is a project uh, developed by HashiCorp and it's under the uh, Mozilla public license version two. So when you go out to look into the GitHub, for all of the EdgeX microservice code, and you wanna look up where is the code for the configuration and registry microservice, well, there isn't any. You're gonna find that uh, because this is an open source project, you can go out and, and download it yourself if you'd like, but we've actually added some conveniences, so that typically isn't necessary. In fact, what we did, and if you look into the GitHub repository, what we did is uh, develop a, a Docker container around that console product. So if you look in our GitHub, you'll see Docker con uh, core console. That is the repo that stores the Docker file and other information to containerize this open source product. So no need to actually download the code. In fact, uh, the guys who uh, work in my shop are very, very rarely downloading console. Uh, they're usually using that convenience of the Docker container when they need to have the configuration uh, registry microservice up. Uh, CloudSci from our Dell uh, shop in Taiwan is the one who uh, did a lot of research on these products and was the one who helped select console. And he's the one who is often the guy who is actually downloading console and then inspecting some of the capabilities out there. Uh, so if you do have some questions about console and how it may operate underneath the covers, uh, certainly shoot me an email and we'll put you in touch with the cloud and try and get any technical aspects that you want from him on what's going on there as best we can. Now, there are a couple of additional uh, repositories or projects, if you will, with inside of EdgeX that do actually uh, amend or append to that console environment. In particular, when console comes up, it knows nothing about our applications, knows nothing about our microservices. So what we did do was write one particular application called the core config seed. Uh, and this particular project, what it does is when it comes up, it initializes um, console with all the data, with all the information for our microservices. This is a Java Spring Boot application, as many of the EdgeX uh, projects are, and it loads that default configuration via either property or YAML files. We'll take a look at that coming up in just a bit. Essentially provides all the key value information for all the uh, application properties to that instance of console running. And this is kind of a strange service because if you watch it run inside of the Docker environment, you're going to be a little bit confused. It comes up uh, very shortly after console comes up and then it does its job and then it exits and never comes up again. In fact, you don't want to run the core config seed application multiple times. Its job is to really initialize things that very first time and then 
if you need to make changes, you're going to do those either programmatically or through the user interface. You're not going to want the config C to do that over and over again each time it comes up. So it has a very simple, very short lifespan to initialize a console on the very first running. We also have another application out there called the Core Config Watcher. This is a uh, wrapper application around some of the console libraries and functions that is available to use in our microservices for watching uh, configuration changes and notifying other microservices. This is a Java console API application. And what it does is allow clients to register in for interest to particular configuration changes and or to receive callbacks or essentially notifications when that configuration has changed. Now, what's interesting is we've got this application out there. It's ready uh, to be used. Uh, we've got it dockerized and, and all else, but we really don't have a use for it today, or I should say we haven't used it today. I think there are plenty of places where this could be used and maybe should be used, but just haven't had a chance yet to really buckle into a lot of the watcher capability. So we'll talk more about that later on in the presentation as well. So how do you bring up the configuration and registration microservice via Docker? As I mentioned, typically we don't download it and run it in its kind of native environment. We just uh, download for convenience sake uh, a Docker container and run it uh, containerized. Well, as I mentioned again, there are three parts to it. Um, there is the console part, there's the watcher part, and there's the config seed. But there's also this element called the um, edgex volume. Uh, that's nothing more than a file space in Docker. So this is not only used by console, but it's also used by things like our database and our logging system. So that's the very first thing you need to bring up is you need to bring up this edgex volume container. Then you bring up the console uh, container that uh, is the actual instance of that console um, mechanism I talked about. And then you start the core config seed, which initializes console. Now, if you're using our Docker Compose file, all these three steps, if you look at the Docker Compose file, are actually the very first three steps in Docker Compose. So as I mentioned, console is the very first thing with regard to edgex as a whole that has to come up. Uh, edgex brings up the volume, the console and config seed, and then all the other services are ready to lock into it once they start to come up. So let's, uh, let's take a look at this from a little bit of a demo uh, standpoint here. Let's see if uh, demo gods are with me here this morning. So give me one second as I pull over a new screen here. So hopefully, I'm kind of looking online here to see if that's coming in okay. Um, so if we take a look right now at my Docker environment, we'll see that uh, I have nothing, uh, nothing running out there. So um, no containers, nothing up and uh, running yet at this point in my Docker environment. But I'm sitting at the point in the del developer scripts where my Docker Compose file is that you can download from GitHub to download and pull in all the Docker containers and get them started for EdgeX. And what I'm going to do is going to bring up those very first three containers. I'm going to do them one at a time. I could use Docker Compose to bring up the whole set. Uh, that would take a while. So I'm just going to start up the first three. So let me, I've got the uh, commands here ready at, uh, at our disposal. So I'm going to bring up the uh, Docker volume. So that's a, a one line command. And let me see if I can zoom in on that a little bit for the, for the sake of uh, everybody out there. Let's see if that, there we go. A little bit better. So just use Docker Compose up dash D volume. And that again is going to bring up that file space system, what we call the edgex files for console to use, as well as things like the database and logging. So that's step number one. Uh, next, we want to bring up um, the uh, actual console instance. So I'm going to bring that up with a, a Docker Compose up dash D console. So that's the instance of console. Again, no real changes, or I should say absolutely no changes that the Dell team or anybody has made to console. It's a simple instance of console. We'll talk about there's a lot of capabilities with console and it could do lots of things in even a distributed environment. We're not really taking advantage of that. We'll talk more about that in a second. So now that's up. So our volume's up, our console uh, environment's up. Next thing we wanna do is bring up the config C. So that comes up and again, that's going to populate, if you will, it's gonna initialize the console environment with all of our microservices uh, configuration information uh, with information about how to check the health and welfare of any one of our services. So that is the application that Dell wrote that does some work there using the APIs in console to uh, get it all set up and ready to now have other microservices tie into it and get its configuration information and such.
So now, interestingly, if I do a, a status check of my environment, we see that the console is up, we see the volume is up, but then you see that the, um, the core config seed is exited. In fact, it, it came up 32 seconds ago and exited 17 seconds ago. So you can see it does its job pretty darn quickly and it just goes away. That's normal, that's, that's perfectly fine. In fact, we don't want the seed to stick around very long. All it does is initialize things the very first time we bring it up and then it goes away and never is brought up again. In fact, if I use Docker Compose to try and bring up all of EdgeX again, you'll see that the config seed immediately exits because there's some stuff in there that we've got that checks to make sure that it's run once before and never run again. So it will check itself and make sure it doesn't reinitialize the console environment. So that's all there really is, gang, to, um, to get EdgeX uh, console config registry all up and running as a microservice. So pretty straightforward. Okay, so once we've got the configuration and registration microservice up and running, what's next? Well, we probably want to take a look at how do our microservices, how does core data, core metadata, how do all the device services, how does any microservice within EdgeX, how does it tie into and get set up and buckled into the configuration registry service? Well, inside of our development environment, as many of you know who are participating in it, most of our microservices today are written in Java and use the Spring framework. Nicely, Spring has actually done a great uh, deal of work with many of these registration configuration mechanisms, and so they provide a convenient library uh, that we can use with inside of our code to actually register any microservice with console and also get configuration information from console. So that library is really easy to use, and I'll talk to you in a second about uh, what we use from that library to get our microservices that are Java-based up and running. For other languages, there are some other languages that do provide similar libraries. In fact, if you check, check out the documentation on our wiki with regard to the uh, configuration registry service, you're going to see out there that there's an example of uh, Python libraries to do some of the similar work that we do with Spring. In other environments, in other languages, if you're planning to write a microservice in something like, oh, I don't know, Go or C, you may not find that console provides a library. So in which case, what console does have is a REST API that you can use. So a little bit more work on your part to connect to and get information in and out of console. But that REST API is kind of the generic interface that even these libraries use underneath the covers. And it's a mechanism you can use from any environment as long as you can speak REST. So given the fact that today everything is um, Java-based, Spring-based, let's take a look at what you need to do in, in building a microservice. Now, for those of you who are not planning to actually go and build another microservice in Java using Spring, um, you may not be all that interested in these steps, but it's also kind of important to understand to get an appreciation of how console works about what's going on in the application environment to actually use this configuration and registration microservice. And it gives you a little bit of a sense of how some of the APIs work if you're gonna do the REST calls. So with regard to our Spring uh, Java microservice, if you want to um, have it use and work with the configuration registration service, the first thing you need to do is add this dependency to a project's palm file. That brings in the libraries that Spring has uh, for console to allow it to communicate with console. Next thing you'll want to do is add a bootstrap properties file to your project. Now you'll notice in every one of our microservices out there today, there is this bootstrap properties file. In fact, you'll actually see a couple of them out there in the application. And that's because this is going to differ for development environments versus Docker runtime environments. And I'll speak to that here in just a second. But what the bootstrap properties file does is it provides information to the application about, first of all, what your application microservice name is. For example, our core data would be called EdgeX core data. It tells us where the host, where, that, where the console instance is located in terms of a runtime environment and what port it's on. It provides information about uh, what's called a profile separator. We'll talk about that here in just a second. And it also tells us whether or not to actually enable this microservice for using the configuration registration microservice. This is a very, very important property. Obviously in set to true, when the microservice comes up, it registers itself with the console and it gets its information in terms of configuration from console. If this is false, it ignores all that. It uses its own configuration and never actually registers itself with console. 
And that's important for things like development environments where maybe you don't want to actually have console running just to work on your particular microservice. So console really provides a nice feature here that allows us to operate with or without it, depending on what kind of runtime environment and what kind of work you're doing. Lastly, too, there's something called a profile uh, that's active. We'll talk about that along with the profile separator here in just a bit. That goes to how configuration information is brought in and used by console and the microservice. So you need to have a bootstrap properties file. You need an enable discovery client annotation on what would be your main app class. That is the main class of the microservice that starts the microservice. Usually it's called something like application class and it's the one with the main method in it. So this particular annotation tells the microservice that it is available to be discovered by console. There's some apparatus inside of Spring uh, that provides this annotation that allows the two, that is the console and the microservice to communicate with each other and actually does do the actual registration work underneath the covers as well. So that simple annotation in your starting class is what really ties the microservice in with from a registration perspective with regard to the console apparatus. So we'll talk more about that coming up here in just a bit. As I mentioned, you'll see every one of these steps already in each one of our microservices today. Now, as I mentioned, depending on what kinds of environments you're running in, you're gonna see a, a different uh, bootstrap properties file. In fact, let me uh, bring in here real quickly a browser to show you a bit of that. So you know that's pretty tiny print. Let's see if we can't uh, zoom in on that a little bit here. There we go, whoops, too much zoom, there we go. Ah. A little better. Okay, so this is, the, uh, this is the bootstrap properties file from Core Data. And you'll notice this is the bootstrap properties file in a uh, path called Docker files in that repository. Now, you'll notice here that we provide essentially all that uh, same property file information as I mentioned with enabled equals true, a profile called Docker. Again, we'll talk about that in a second. And we're telling it where to find console. And this would be the typical uh, namespace used for console when we're again using Docker. However, if I bring up the other bootstrap properties file that you will find inside of core data, and this is the one in the development path of the source main resources directory of core data. So it's the same microservice, but just a different location. This is the one we use in development. And notice what we do with regard to enable. We say false. In other words, when we're doing development work, when we're just working on the core data code, we don't want it to have to register in with console all the time. We just want it to come up and use its own local configuration information as opposed to using console. So having these different bootstrap property files out there allow the application essentially to operate with or without console, depending on what kind of environment you intend to run in. But that can be used to your favor as well, even in some sort of production environment. If you choose not to use console, if you maybe want to use a different registry service, you can start to see how that allows for a great deal of flexibility. Okay. Let's see here, so where are we at? So how does the configuration work? Okay, so this is some of the meat now about how that data comes into the microservice once it is registered and, and using console to get its configuration information. So when the microservice comes up, again, that enabled discovery client annotation that is inside of the uh, main application class, that's what gets the service connected and activating console and the communication between the two. And then again, based on that bootstrap properties file, if the enable is turned on, then what that microservice now knows to do is to go over to console and get its configuration data and set up that microservice as opposed to using the local properties file. When that is enable is false, then in each one of the microservices are one and sometimes many different uh, local property files where the configuration information is provided. The data organization around that particular configuration information is pretty critical here. In each application, even if we weren't using something like console, you'd find a lot of different files out in the application that would provide what we call key value pairs to provide those critical pieces of information that the application needs not to have to hard code everything into the actual programming language. So for example, in every one of our microservices, 
there's a key value pair called server port. And this dictates what port that particular microservice comes up on when it starts to run. This doesn't change when we go to console. In other words, we still need key value pairs. What does change, however, is the fact that console allows for multiple namespaces, meaning it has to track all sorts of key value pairs for all sorts of microservices, and potentially all sorts of microservices running in different what they call profiles, essentially development or production environments. So we'll talk about that here in just a second as well. So when we look at console and we look at configuration information, this simple server port uh, key value pair turns out now to look something like this, where we have to provide a little bit more namespace information as to which that key value pair actually um, is associated with. In this case, server port is associated to the core metadata microservice versus core data microservice in the second example. So you can start to see how namespaces allow for a console to keep track of all sorts of configuration information and just associate it to the right uh, microservice. Or for that matter, you can have it associated to other things that you might find necessary in your particular application environment. We're using namespace to help differentiate or associate configuration information to particular microservices. Additionally, console provides for something called a profile. What profiles do are allow you to further distinguish configuration information for different conditionals or environmental types of configurations. So if you look in the uh, console documentation, or if you look in our wiki page for our own documentation on EdgeX, you'll see this kind of demonstration where not only do we provide a namespace and we provide the key value pair, but we can also provide this semicolon and then an additional indicator, which is the profile indicator for particular configuration information. So in this case, we're showing that core data server port in a development environment is 480080, or in a Docker environment it is also 480080. We could obviously change those so that your uh, microservice comes up in a development environment on a different port than it does in a Docker environment. So you can start to see that with console and with our configuration microservice that if you do want to bring it up in things like development environments or testing environments or other environments, you can do so and have different configuration information for the same properties without having to go and set up all sorts of different paraphernalia to make that happen. Console is kind of the one-stop shop and allows you through both namespaces and profiles to have different configuration brought into the application based on however it is running. Now you might wonder, well, how does the microservice when it comes up know to tell console about which uh, particular namespace to use, which particular type of uh, profile use? Well, you might remember back in the bootstrap pro uh, properties file, the profile is specified as well as the application name, which again is what we use to specify the namespace. So that bootstrap properties file is what's used by the spring to console communication to let it know which of the configuration data to bring into the application. If you also look in the core config seed uh, uh, application I mentioned that Dell wrote, this is the, the mechanism that we use to actually specify all the configuration information in that initialization process for console. So if you actually go out and look at the files in core config seed and GitHub, you can actually see all sorts of uh, key value pair property files out there that use these namespaces and these profiles to dictate what gets brought into our um, EdgeX microservices. And in particular, we don't use a lot of the profiles. The two profiles we use are really just a default profile and then a Docker profile for when we are operating inside of a Docker runtime environment. But we certainly could in the future, or you could if you choose to set up a alternate uh, development environments to use that to your disposal to bring in even more types of configuration information. So one thing I mentioned is that um, console comes with a UI already. Um, and that UI uh, is a great way to actually explore some of this configuration information and the details I just provide you. When console comes up by default, the web interface that it offers is also always brought up and it's available on port 8500 at whatever address console happens to be running on. So I have right now already a console up and running as you saw with my Docker environment. So let me bring my browser back in here. And let me go here. This is the, um, this is the default page uh, 
uh, of the uh, web interface uh, for a console. It comes up and it lets you know what services it sees, um, what uh, types of information are immediately available. And you'll see that it knows that it, it is already up and running. And it's actually out there looking for the EdgeX uh, Mongo database uh, to be up and running as well. We've kind of programmed it as that's one um, service that we would like to see up and running quickly. And so we've programmed it to kind of go out and look for that, although I did not start that yet. So you can see that it already is telling us that that particular service is not available. In other words, the ping check on that is failing. We'll have more on that in just a bit coming up. Up as well. But importantly, as we were talking about the configuration information, how do I see that through console and through this web interface? There's this uh, tab at the top called key value pair. I'm going to click on that. And you can see it offers a single configuration uh, repository, if you want to think of it in that way, where all of the information about the EdgeX configuration has been stored, again, by that core config seed application. And as you note, there is a configuration out there for each one of our microservices. In fact, you'll find two, one that is labeled, for example, core data, and one core data Docker. That's that profile I mentioned. We put a profile in place for the Docker environment for each one of our microservices, again, through that initialization procedure. And if we punch in on any one of these particular microservices, for example, let's take a look at what is in the configuration settings for core data. If any of you have actually started to mess around with some of the code in our microservice land already, many of these properties will already be things that you're familiar with because you'll see them already in our application properties files with inside the code. So these override whatever is in that microservice. For example, if you wanna know exactly what type of message is being displayed when the application opens with regard to our uh, core data microservice, you can open up the app open message property and you see the value associated to that is, this is the core data microservice. So if you're watching the logs and you see those messages, now you know where they're coming from. They're actually coming from the configuration properties, which may be inside the application's files directly if it's running in kind of a development environment, or it's coming from console in the case where we're referring to console for that config information. So key value pairs is really all of what the configuration is about, and then just stored with regard to namespaces and profiles inside of console. Okay, so config watchers. Um, as I mentioned, there is another um, application that Dell wrote called this microservice uh, core config watcher. Uh, what this allows us to do is um, have the console operation, uh, operation actually tell any particular um, microservice that some sort of change has occurred with inside of the configuration. In other words, it provides a notification or what's called a callback back to any microservice whenever there's been an update to the configuration. By the way, in that UI I just showed you, you can actually use that UI to change the configuration data as well. And if I had done so, and if we had a config watcher in place with some sort of microservice registered for those changes, then it would immediately send out a notification to the microservice that's asked for that so that it gets those updates. Health checks can also uh, result in callbacks. In other words, if it determined that one of our microservices had fallen down and was not operational by its ping check, you could also use the same config watcher to send out notification that that indeed is the case. So in other words, it would provide a means to alert other microservices that may be dependent on uh, some microservice that, hey, it's not working, it's not up right now. So console provides this concept of a watcher to both uh, register for interest in a particular configuration setting or again, some sort of health check. And it also provides the mechanism for the callback to occur. Now, as I mentioned, we've built this functionality into EdgeX. The microservice stands there ready to be used but we're not using it yet today in our microservices. This was kind of a later feature that we started to add into um, Fuse, which became EdgeX. And we just haven't had a chance yet really to get back into the microservices and build in the facilities to receive those callback signals and to register for which particular configuration changes or health status checks we want to be notified of. So we'll talk more in a second about what some of the features of console are that we can maybe look at as we go forward to even enhance EdgeX more. And certainly this is one of them. And it certainly is something available to all of you who are thinking about building applications or microservices out there to think about maybe how to make more industrial strength uh, microservices going forward, because there's a lot of capability here to make them much more dynamic and, if you will, re resistant to things like um, problems in other microservices. <laughs> 
Now, how does the registry work? Well, when the microservice comes up, it actually registers with console. There's a bootstrap process that's already done. It's actually automatically included with the Spring libraries. I showed you some of the annotations that actually avail that uh, capability into our application set today. So this is wonderful. You really don't have to do anything to enable your microservice, if it's Java base, uh, to register itself into uh, console. It's all done by those libraries and some simple annotations. And of course, also enabling console, as opposed to, again, those development environments where you may choose to disable it. And once it is registered, console is periodically going to ping the microservice for a status check. Um, if you recall, as we looked at each one of the microservices throughout our tech talks, I always showed you a ping API in each one of the microservices. That was there for several reasons, but one of the reasons is, is that console actually uses that address. We actually set a health check path to each one of the microservices to that ping address. And that's what the registry actually uses then once it knows about that microservice to periodically make a call in. And if that ping comes back, then it knows things are good, at least from a it's up perspective. And if it doesn't come back, then that's when that watcher could take effect and start to allow other microservices to be notified that we got a problem. Or it could even allow something like a third party application or a system management utility know that we have a problem. So it's a pretty slick apparatus that really requires no work on our part to get it up and running. Uh, the only thing that you have to do and think about is if you're dealing with developing in other languages, again, if you don't have a convenience library like Spring offers, you may have to do some REST API calls to both register into the uh, console registry and then do any kind of query or health checks on your own. Now, there are some future features that we think all of us as a community may want to think about with regard to the configuration and registry microservice. As I mentioned, this has been a great deal of help for all of us in the Dell community to have the service available to kind of centralize configuration, provide for that registry mechanism so we know the health, but we don't quite today use all of its capabilities. Uh, CloudSci, who again is our, our expert in this area, has done wonderful work here, uh, and he will provide for you some points about some of the things that he thinks are, I think, areas where we really maybe even can take more advantage. So what are some of those places that we need to think about? Well, one of the things that we do, again, we don't have other microservices using the registry to discover another service. In other words, we don't have a uh, core data service dynamically going out to the registry service saying I need the address for metadata. We do use the configuration mechanism in there to get that property dynamically. So if you're changing the address of one of the services, then say when core data comes up, it's going to know that because it gets that uh, address through the console config data. But we don't ask, have a built into any one of the services a dynamic check for and get of any address each and every time it's making some sort of request. So so that's something we can certainly think about. Again, we don't utilize the watchers. We mentioned that uh, already a couple times. And certainly with regard to system management, health checks, and even broader uh, notifications and alert service, we could certainly start to tie these together so there's a better health and welfare check of the EdgeX system based on some of this functionality. And we also don't use a, a very big capability built into console, which is the uh, leader follow follower capability. In other words, console was actually built to operate on the basis of three instances at a minimum running at any one time. And that's for uh, load balancing and failover kind of capability where one leader instance of console is always what systems are kind of going to. But if that leader is not available, it goes to one of the followers and the follower becomes the leader and then it, uh, it eventually flops itself so the leaders and followers are, are again, uh, uh, associated in the right order, but it always allows for availability of the system and allows for a much more distributed and heavy duty system. We just use one instance of console a day. Now that's something to consider from two perspectives. A, maybe we could take advantage of this and make for an even more industrial strength, powerful edge X system in those environments where we have the ability to run three instances. Or B, since we're not using this pretty big feature, which really requires uh, quite a bit of code and, and apparatus to make run, um, that might be something we consider in terms of, well, is maybe console too much for us? Are there other registry configuration environments which would have a, maybe a smaller footprint because we're just not taking advantage of some of that capability? So as all things architecture are related, there's always pluses and minuses. And this is one of those that we'll have to kind of consider as we go forward is 
should we be exploring simpler alternatives or do we like console? And do we maybe even want to start to think about using some of its richer, maybe more enterprise capability to help uh, EdgeX operate even better? So be interested in anybody's input on that as we go forward and as we start to work through not just getting EdgeX up and running for things like our Barcelona release, but going beyond that and starting to think about future capability. Um, how do we want to address this going forward? So some things to think about, gang. Uh, again, nothing in this world is always straightforward and, and black and white, but there are lots of gray edges and some things that we certainly see as potential out of console going forward. Well, folks, that wraps up a uh, discussion here today on the configuration and registry microservice. Upcoming tech talks, we're going to talk a bit about the export services and things like Rules Engine. Going to have a talk on the device service SDK. Probably my uh, super genius Tyler Cox will be on the radio then to give you some background on that. And we'll also take a look at some porting uh, services like logging and notifications. If you've got other suggestions, if you've got other needs, uh, please let us know. Again, email me, use the Rocket Chat or use the um, uh, mailing list to let us know recommendations about what you'd like to see in upcoming Tech Talks. With that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, questions. I'll take any and all. If they're about uh, configuration registry, great. If they're about something else in EdgeX, that's good too. Whatever you'd like to talk about. And I'm checking out right now. Brett, my chat window, don't see any right now. Folks, feel free to use the, um, the Zoom group chat as well if you don't feel like coming up online or unmuting yourself. Hi, Jim. I, this is Riaz. I have a question. Shoot, Riaz. Uh, as we get into discussion of uh, cross-component or cross-container security challenges, uh, I suppose this one is a sensitive one, right? Because it looks like today the API basically allows any caller to, to request either seeing the data or making changes to the data. Is that a fair assumption? Uh, that's true. Right now, that is the case, um, Riaz. There are features in console, though, to protect that data as well. So again, that's probably one of those things I should have listed on the uh, on the future feature set that we could certainly take advantage of. Uh, that is, there are some security apparatuses that we just haven't turned on or, or um, availed ourselves to yet. But certainly, as part of the security group, that may be something you want to take a look at, see if that's going to be um, useful and good enough, or if we may need to think about replacing console for security reasons as well. Oh, that's great. So that, where is, is that uh, URL you provided earlier or is there yep. somewhere to go and look at the, some of the security features? Yeah, the uh, the console.io website has a lot of that, and um, and I would also put you in touch with if you haven't uh, had a chance to to communicate with him yet. Uh, uh, Cloud Sci again is is the guy who's really been um, instrumental in helping us get this microservice uh, up and running, and and he's researched some of the alternatives as well. So if we do decide, oh wow, you know, from a security standpoint, this may not work, he might be able to help uh, outline what he's seen and things like Zookeeper, Eureka, and a few others that we looked at as far as alternatives. That's great, yeah. That, so uh, I did actually meet Kyle, I guess, in the London meeting, but I don't have yeah. his contact info. Is that available on the wiki or? Uh, if it it's if you can't find it out there, or if you if you prefer to, just uh, send me an email, uh, Riaz. I'll be um, happy to to send it out to you. Uh, I think since you're in the Dell EMC family, if you um, if you are able to get online, he's in the directory out there. But I know from from some of the non-main Dell companies that may be difficult. So feel free to just shoot me an email. I'll get you that. Okay, I'll do. And one one other question. Um, uh, I realize you said some of the <clears throat> uh, calls and the actual usage of watcher capability is not in place yet, but just at the functionality level, is the granularity of asking for, let's say, notification on change or uh, health alerts, is it at the level of, uh, maybe not the health alerts, but on the config stuff, is it at the level of uh, key value pair or is it at higher level? Yeah, that's a great question. Riaz. In fact, the, um, the functionality allows you to do either. You could say, hey, I'm interested in only this one property, or maybe I'm interested in a particular namespace or, or whatever the case may be. So um, we haven't used a lot of that API yet, so I cannot speak to all of the search or filtering capability there, but I do know it's uh, fairly extensive uh, from just looking at the documentation. 
Uh, and, and one thing I'd have to check too, Riaz, is the Watcher um, application that we built. I'm not sure how much of that is surfaced through. I don't know if um, if we just surface uh, key value pair instances or entire namespaces. We'd have to probably take a look at that functionality a bit. Wouldn't be hard to do to surface more of it up. Um, as it's it's in place, we just really haven't a chance to really look at that in any kind of uh, depth yet. But console does come with a, a fair degree of flexibility there. Very good, thanks. You bet. Other questions? So Jim, this is Salim. Yes, Salim. It seems we already have a fragment of system management support through this. You know, uh, Salim, as, I, as I've uh, indicated to you in some of the discussions we had, um, you know, uh, at Dell, we already started down the path of implementing some system management capability. Uh, and, and yes, console was going to be a part of that. We saw that with regard to the health checks um, as certainly a big part of it. Uh, we already started to build out the base services I mentioned to you to do things like start, stop uh, type of functionality and, and then being able to use the health check to maybe uh, see and sink in with that to make sure that, you know, when you restart something, did it actually come up? So some of that, yeah, we started down that path and that's why we did outfit things like all the microservices with a ping address to make sure that they were addressable by a service like this. So there are elements of some of the system management thoughts. What we just don't have is kind of a, um, a wholesale uh, thought process about exactly how we're going to do it, what exactly we need. And, and on top of all this, what's going to manage that, right? You typically would want some sort of facility, maybe like a Pulse or, or a Leota that kind of is bringing it all together under uh, a single pane of glass and, and single system. But I think there are elements there. And then we certainly see consoles providing a great deal of capability to help out with that. So, so you have the heartbeat, uh, the, the ping capability, and also you have a UI to change uh, configurations. Absolutely, yeah. And in fact, um, we actually uh, were looking at some work as well when we were building some of our um, uh, Dell UI on top of EdgeX. Uh, you know, we were actually just using some of the REST calls in console because we could see that uh, there might be some cases where people want to kind of brand or flavor the UI a little bit, you know, and the rest calls that are out there on console uh, are exactly what the web interface is using too. So even if you didn't want to use that uh, UI, it's pretty darn easy to, uh, to develop the same capability and, and ducktail it into your own UI. Cool. Jim, could, uh could console be used, or is it intended to be used for higher level operations, like if I want to shut down a microservice, is there the concept of setting a value like a state of microservice in console and then expect microservice itself to get notified and go down, or is it not intended for that level of management? Yeah, Riaz, we, we, uh, at least I haven't seen, uh, and that might be a question for Cloud, but I haven't seen an API set in there that says, you know, um, what's the shutdown or start address. However, um, we, uh, as part of uh, the Dell uh, community, as I was mentioning uh, with regard to, to Salim's question, we started to investigate system management needs and started to think about it a little bit. And so what we were building into every one of the microservices that we had was what we call a, a base class, a base microservice class that we called the device or the um, service class that we put those APIs to do things like uh, potentially stop, restart yourself type of thing. And we thought that it would be pretty easy to offer some sort of API on top of that. Now, whether or not that is activated by um, some sort of configuration change or whether it's a REST call that just is made directly, that was more to the details of, well, how do you want to trigger that functionality versus, you know, where does the functionality actually start to reside? But I think certainly you could do something like have a configuration property that, you know, is the uh, check me for restart. And if it's set to true, uh, that microservice base service that we talked about could say, ah, you know, somebody set that time for me to restart start myself. Uh, so certainly things like that are possible. I don't know if that's the appropriate use of console or not. And, and we're going to leave it to uh, system management experts to, to kind of help us a little bit and guide us on what is the mechanism to do some of that work? Um, but I think a direct answer to your question, I don't believe console would be the type of thing that other than through configuration information provides any direct uh, system management calls. It just facilitates the data to which a system management uh, system could use. Again, things like that status health check um, or configuration data, but not necessarily um, making the direct calls themselves. Mm -hmm. 
other questions? I'll pause a bit and then I ask you another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jim, not, not uh, directly related to, uh, to console, but about uh, microservices shutting down, um, what capability exists today to serialize state uh, so uh, they, can, uh, they can resume from that uh, shutdown uh, state they're in? Yeah, yeah, great question, uh, Salim. What we try to do is make each microservice um, really an, an independent operation as much as possible and to be stateless as much as possible. Um, that's why we provide things like uh, the database behind the scenes so that anything that is state related can be stored there. Um, and, and also console is a big part of that. You know, you, if you change configuration, you wanna be able to bring it back up and have that change that you made in configuration uh, readily available. So console provides a great deal of that. So we've tried to, to the best of our ability, make the microservices stateless so that you could start, stop them all day long. And that state that they have is regathered from whatever persistent stores they're using like console or the database to come back up in the state they were in. Now, obviously if there's a rest call or something happening on that microservice, just at the time you stop, you know, you're going to lose that session. You're going to lose, you know, lose that particular call, but otherwise they should be fairly innocuous to, um, to, to start stop type of operations. Well, that's why we have the notion of graceful shutdown so that you finish uh, things in progress. Um, yep, and that might be something we would have to, you know, if we really wanted to make sure that um, each and every operation is is finalized before that stop or start or whatever occurs, that might be something we could, uh, could look at. But that would actually be pretty simple to do given kind of the uh, architecture. The, you know, we're using the uh, MVC pattern, so that controller has kind of the central location for operations to come through and it wouldn't be too hard to put in something in there that says, well, if we've got things going on, you know, don't, don't stop yet. Um, so that wouldn't be too hard to, to influence. Um, our look at it as well, given the work we did at Dell, again, trying to do more of a proof of concept project than an industrial strength system at this point was that, you know, is, is every call out to the microservice absolutely critical to complete? There might be some things, if, if you're getting a temperature of 72 every second, if you miss one of those, it wasn't gonna be the end of the system. But as we start to look at more real-time systems or more um, uh, mission critical type systems like a heart monitor or something, obviously that's gonna be a little bit different. Right, right. Well, clearly that's gonna be a very important capability for uh, uh, software patch updates, security patch updates. And yeah, the absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yep. Jim, the, primitive, the primitives that you put in for management into the microservices today, are they based on just core functions or are they based on one of the, one of the management APIs that exists? Yeah, and, and uh, first off, that, that code is not actually out there as part of the code that's in EdgeX today. That's kind of the that's Dell research stuff that we haven't uh, put out there. We were waiting to kind of get the system management group up and going. We could certainly make it available. There's nothing in that code that is um, proprietary or contains any IP, but just want to make sure everybody realizes that we did not put that in there until we started to get a feel from the industry about what to do there. And, and Philip, it was for that very reason that we didn't add it, is that we looked at um, uh, several protocols out there. In fact, uh, as Salim knows, and as I've discussed with him, uh, we had religious wars even internally to our own organization about you know what were the um, the choices with regard to standards in this area that we should be using. And we could not get a consistent opinion and we could not get kind of a definitive, this is what we should use. Um, so we kind of took the approach that we built this API that allows for it to, um, at a higher level, be associated to any other kind of uh, standard, lightweight M2M, uh, Redfish, you name, you name it, whatever you want to use, that we'd kind of provide an abstraction layer that was central to EdgeX, but could be abstracted out to any kind of protocol. We kind of viewed the whole system management API like we view device services or the northbound services. And that is, we didn't think that there was gonna be an API winner yet. And so we kind of needed to avail ourselves to multiples potentially. Whether or not that's the case and the path we take, uh, again, I'm, we're gonna put that in the hands of our chairman, Mr. Salim, and see what he comes back with. <laughs> Actually, I should say Dr. Salim. Sorry, Salim, I downgrade you there for a second. Uh, leave it with uh, Dr. Salim and see what he uh, comes back with. 
but I think uh, that's going to be an interesting aspect that we're going to have to address eventually is are we adhering to an API set uh, from some standard or are we going to have our own? And I know uh, Salim's already started some of that research. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. You know, this comment, Jim, I mean, one way to look at EGX is, is uh, mapping from many uh, protocols and uh, data formats to um, a unified minimal REST JSON based set. Um, and, you know, this is how I view its main value here. And, and that applies to system management as well. Sleem, I think you're exactly on the right path. At least that was, that was the path that I was tending down to, that as we look at that edge X box and we see the north and the southbound, to me, um, that system management is just another one of the edges to edge X, that it really is uh, going to be protocol agnostic in the center and then can be protocol specific on the outside, depending on which, which your protocol of choice is. Uh, I, we may not be able to do that initially. We may have to make some tough choices initially just so we can get something out the door for expedience sake. But I think if we engineer and architect it the right way, we should avail ourselves to multiple uh, protocols because I don't know if there'll be one clear winner yet. Uh, and, and there's potential um, for that other side, that security side, that we may have to think about some things in that way as well. I think in this space of IoT today that there are just no clear winners because if there were, uh, EdgeX wouldn't exist and wouldn't be um, having the 60 companies plus joining this to try and figure out how to solve that edge problem. Other questions? Jim, when you demoed that uh, console, you are, it reminded me of the discussion we had a while back regarding whether the, the management web application that you had developed as part of Fuse is going to be in scope or out of scope for, uh, for EGEX. Uh, any decision on that? Do we know where? Yeah, great, uh, great question, Riaz, and, and excellent timing. I just sent a note out to um, to uh, the developer of that uh, UI uh, last night, uh, essentially saying, "Hey, what what would it take? Give me the number of hours it would take to at least remove the Dell branding from that, and to remove um, anything that um, would not be more general to EdgeX as opposed to specific to something like a Dell Gateway." My thought process is, and subject to um, to where we go from a community standpoint, my thought process is if we could at least get that UI available so things like demos could occur, even if it's not something we release to the open source community immediately, at least it would be available sitting on the side so that for things like the Barcelona demos we want to do, it's available. Um, Dell doesn't have any uh, desire to to use that as you know some sort of productization of EdgeX. It was just our means to um, demonstrate the capability. Unfortunately, it, it had or was using some um, Dell um, packages that uh, have since been sold off. And so it, it, some of the technology underneath the covers uh, we'd have to remove in order to be able to distribute that publicly. And that may be a, a path we take as well. But my first step, my first inkling is, let's at least have that UI sitting on the side, even though it would be a Dell thing, anybody could use it for a demo type of purpose. And then from a community standpoint, let's prioritize that work. If there is a UI need, and somebody is willing to take that Dell UI and clean it up and remove proprietary items, and maybe that's Dell uh, ourselves, or or maybe that's some other company that thinks they have a better thought process or a better idea about how the UI should look and behave. Uh, let's prioritize that work and figure out where that goes on the workload. But first and foremost, let's at least be able to uh, demonstrate EdgeX appropriately with good uh, EdgeX branding and colors and things like that. And then let's figure out who and what is providing a more industrial strength UI on top. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Any other questions, folks? And I do realize we are at the nine o'clock hour, so I don't want to um, take anybody away from anything they have to do. So uh, first of all, let me just say thanks again for everybody for uh, joining me this morning. Hopefully these are still useful to you. Um, we'll, we'll again be looking at things like export services and the device service SDK coming up uh, shortly in the weeks to follow. <laughs> and uh, hopefully to see everybody in Barcelona. I'll stick around here for a few more minutes too if anybody has other questions, but otherwise, thanks very much. Thank you. Just a quick question, when is core meeting today?
Is it right uh, the core meeting? No, it's. Uh, I think it's in an hour from now. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Brett. If you're still along the line, I think it's at eleven o'clock Central Time. Okay. All right. Thank you. Correct, Jim. It looks like 11 o'clock Eastern time, so 10 o'clock Central. 10 o'clock Central. Yes, yeah. yes, yep, thank you. Man, with all these time zones, we need a <laughs> universal EdgeX clock. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Tony. Other questions? Hearing none, then I will wrap it up. Hey, thanks uh, very much, everybody. And, uh, and Brett, thanks for getting up super early to, as always, uh, be our sound man in the booth there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, all. Thanks, Jim. Bye -bye.